All right, here goes nothing. Hopefully you can hear me. Hopefully you can see me. <laughs> oh, it went back a little bit, so you got a little preview of what I'm gonna talk about. All right, hello beautiful people. My name is Amanda Zitto. If you are new here, I make motorcycle travel vlogs, how to's, and general encouragement for you to get out and do the thing. And this is our monthly Q&A live stream, which I love doing because it means I get to talk to all of you a little bit more directly, which is just one of my favorite things. <laughs> Let me move the chat over here so I can see you guys a little bit better. All right. Hello, David. Hi, Gigi. Oh, thank you. 96 Heritage, that's awesome. Hello, Luna. <laughs> I hope you haven't been waiting for too long. <laughs> Jay Cruz, Jay Crozer, I'm sorry if I said your name right, wrong. Robert, Vincent, Paul, Barb, Scott, Chris, all of my favorite people are here. Hello. Yay. Hi, Bob. Oh, and my mom is here. Excellent. I thought my mom wasn't going to be here because they were cutting cows. So I'm glad my mom is here. This is lovely. Hi, Falcro. Okay. Well, travel safe. Have a good journey. Um, before I dive into questions, I have a couple of things that I would like to talk about. Um, because people keep asking me, even though we kind of went over it in the last Q&A, what my travel plans for this year is. Um, uh, I'm going camping in the Gorge next week, which is exciting, but that's not a part of the general travel plan. <laughs> um, April, I'm going home to Montana. It's very exciting. Uh, June, I'm going to be doing the Idaho BDR. I've been getting a couple of like event invites and I have to like sadly turn them down because uh, pretty much for like a whole half of the half of June, I'm going to be on the Idaho BDR and leading up to that, I'm going to be preparing for the Idaho BDR. So it's very exciting. And also I want to give a huge, huge shout out and thank you to everybody who's been donating on Ko-Fi to the Idaho BDR fund. That means the world to me and it's making the trip feel like a real thing that's going to happen. <laughs> so that's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Oh, the other thing that I need to announce is that Rocky Mountain Roll is sold out in case you missed any of my other announcements. So unfortunately, there will be no more tickets sold. Um, I do every year get a couple of people who reach out and say that they can't come last minute. So if you're somebody who can make plans short notice, um, you can email me and I'll put you on a little wait list in case uh, people can't make it and a ticket opens up. Um, and you can email Rocky Mountain Roll, like Rocky MTN Roll at gmail.com, and I will add you to that list. No promises. That is strictly a if somebody can't come and their a ticket opens up, that's that what that situation is. But for the most part, we are sold out for 2021. And if you did not manage to get your ticket, I hope that I get to see you next year. I can't believe that we sold out so quickly. So thank you. That's that's all because of you guys. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, beautiful people. Is there going to be t-shirts for this year's rumor? Dennis, I am doing my best. I have to color it and get it all finished up. The line work is already done. And I'm sure that you've seen that on Rocky on the Instagram. If, uh, if you don't follow the Instagram, do that. Um, I already posted the line work. I need to get it colored so that I can get a quote for t-shirts for this year. Um, it won't be a big batch run, um, but I'm... My goal is to do t-shirts. That's what I'll say. I make no promises, but that's my goal. <laughs> Hello from the Netherlands. Oh my gosh. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Blue Mountains. Oh, gorgeous. Hello. Hi. <laughs> All right. Uh, and my other thing that I want to tell you guys about is that I have new stickers. Um, they're get out and do a thing stickers. They're see-through, so this doesn't look like anything, but I put one on something black so that you can actually see what it looks like. I don't even know if you can actually see it. Hold on. I have to be able to see what you're seeing. There we go. That. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Yay! So I new get out and do a thing uh, clear stickers um, that are from Sticker Mule, so they're nice, high quality. And those will be going up in my Etsy shop Monday. They'll be up in the shop on Monday. So I'm very excited about that. Hi! Hello! Yay! Oh, and somebody asked before the stream even started if we were drinking tonight, and yes. Yes, we are. This is uh, Bird Dog and some LaCroix. 
don't judge me. We're out of Coca-Cola in this house right now. Hello from Western North Carolina. Oh, it's so beautiful there. I hope that your guys' weather is doing good on the up for spring. I need that for my laptop. Yay! New st yes, excellent. <laughs> Man, the delay this time is like, hello, you guys. Ah, uh, yay. From Ireland? Hello! Apple juice? Mm, yes. Uh... Uh, I don't e no, I don't even think you can call this one apple juice. I think you can call apple like the hard cider apple juice, but this is this is definitely not apple juice. This is definitely this is definitely like fermented corn juice and uh, sparkling water. <laughs> Stacy, I feel called out. <laughs> Hello from British Columbia. Oh my gosh, all over the place. This is so cool. <laughs> Hello. Awesome, awesome. It's eight. Oh wow. Okay. Now we're now we're climbing. Here we go. <laughs> Stickers. Oh yay. Okay, cool. I'm glad that other people are excited about them. I got them and I was like, they look cool. I don't know if anybody else will think that they're cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. I'm I hope that it works out. Um that uh, our timelines work up together. Hello, Wild Rider. Did you receive my stickers? Some people haven't yet, and it's been a month. Wild Rider, I think that I did. I believe that I did. Sorry, time is super weird for me right now. Um, but I did get a couple of um, sticker packs in the P.O. Box recently, so I think that I did. <laughs> Tenere 700 in the future. I mean, I would love to ride one. I definitely can't afford to own one right now. <laughs> Um, oh my goodness. Oh, especially because, like, the Tenere, uh, is super hard to get your hands on in the U.S. right now. Um, uh, Ryan, who runs Al Cycle in Hamilton, who's one of our awesome supporters for Rocky Mountain Roll, he waited ages to get his T7. It was the only one that got sent to their store, and he bought it. So, <laughs> maybe, maybe if I ask really nice, he'll let me ride it. That would be super fun. Um, but definitely not owning one anytime soon, that's for sure. I think Africa Twin is definitely gonna happen before a T Tenere 7 Tenere, t oh my gosh before a T7 does can you tell I drunk a little bit before the stream started <laughs> um, and that's not saying that I would bu I'm buying an Africa Twin anytime soon I'm just saying that in the case that I would be buying a new bike the Africa Twin would happen before the T7 did that's what I'm saying don't get your hopes up for a new bike because that's not happening anytime soon <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> Greetings from Kent, England. If you don't know where Kent is, imagine GB in person. Kent is where God would stick the tube if you gave us in it. Oh, wow. Ian, that's very explicit. <laughs> so I made it here. Yay! Hello, everybody. From New Zealand. Oh, my goodness. I was curious, have you ever weighed your bike luggage? I have not actually sat down and put everything on a scale. Um, I think, like, Carl did once. I don't remember how much he said his stuff was, but it was really heavy, and I went and, like, felt his bags, and I went and felt my bags, and mine were definitely less heavy than his. So I think at that point we guesstimated that my, at least my saddlebags, were 50 pounds. Um, and so that would make like my, uh, like a rough estimate would make my duffel bag like 25 pounds or something like that. Um, still a lot of weight, but definitely not more than having a person on the back of a bike. So I was definitely within my limits. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I don't have a more accurate, uh, statement for you. <laughs> oh, Sandy's here. Hi, Sandy. Hello. Yay. <laughs> Yes, you can tell. Oh, thanks, David. <laughs> Is that because I'm already like halfway through my drink? I'm I I brought the whiskey and another Lacroix into the office this time so that I can refill. First ride of 2021 yesterday. <laughs> Hi, hello. From Australia? Oh my gosh, you guys! Wow. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us. 
That's awesome. I did get some uh, questions from Instagram, so I'm going to dive into those. Um, first question said, do you use an app for planning routes? I think I've answered this question quite a few times. Um, but the simple answer is yes, I do use apps, plural, to plan routes. Um, I try to use multiple apps to get the thing rolling. So I use Rever because they have awesome Butler uh, routes. So a lot of highlighted roads that are really good just for motorcycling, um, curvy, beautiful views. So Rever is an excellent resource. Um, if you haven't tried that already, I use the paid version. So I get access to all of those Butler routes. Um, Onyx Off-Road is actually an awesome app to use um, when you're planning uh, especially local adventures because it has a lot of like highlighted like four by four trails and that kind of stuff that are super fun. So Onyx Off-Road is something that I have definitely added to my list of apps that I go through when I'm planning new adventures. It's also just really good at showing you the borders of like where public lands are and where private land is. And um, it does its best to, to show you what government agency is uh, in charge of that land. So if you are dispersed camping, you know how long you're allowed to stay there and what rules you're supposed to be abiding by. So Onyx Off-Road is a really good app. Um, and then I use a couple of other apps to try to like pull up weird tourist attractions, like road trippers. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's the general answer. Oh, Nathan, thank you for the super chat. Cheers, my friend. Hugs and happy Sunday. Thank you. If you guys are not following For the Love of Knobs, you definitely should be. Do it. Cool. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers from Georgie. Yeah, yeah, hi. Hello. From, oh my gosh, I don't even know if I could say that town name. I'm assuming it's in Massachusetts. We are doing our thing. Oh, yay, hi. It's beard bikes and camping. I need to connect with you on the app, like testing out the Africa Twin soon. That's gonna happen soon. Like definitely before I head to Montana in April. We'll, we're gonna make it happen. I'm glad I could finally make one. Had to cut a ride shirt. Oh, well, oh, I feel extra special because you stopped riding to come and watch this. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. That's awesome. Oh, thank you, Ian. You guys are just so sweet to me. All these exotic lands make Wisconsin sound kind of lame. <laughs> <laughs> Wisconsin is awesome. <laughs> yes, Chris, thank you. you. My thoughts exactly. Wisconsin is the land of cheese. Nothing lame about that. Yes, 100%. Hi, Robin. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, I'm sorry, Nova. Oh, time is weird. I'm happy you're here now, though. That's awesome. You, d you haven't missed a whole lot. <laughs> I don't have heavy my camping supplies are, but I don't believe it would be more heavy than another person, right? Yes, yes, exactly. I um, I did have, I did take everything off the bike once, like, to uh, have a pasture when I was, like, riding through Helena um, when I first started riding, and they were definitely way heavier than all of my luggage, uh, to the point where you could, like, you could, it, it was very obvious that my luggage was not the same weight as having another person on the back, so I felt pretty good about myself. <laughs> Yay! From Vancouver, Washington? Well, hello! Yay! Just the forks rebuild, so it's good to go. Oh, awesome! That's exciting. Hello from Wyoming! How's your drone treating you? Thinking of getting one. Um, I don't use it as much as uh, you would want to use something that you spent a grand for. <laughs> um... Also know that if you're planning on using a drone and you have a channel that's over the 1,000 subscriber mark and you monetize your videos, you do need to be licensed through the FAA to use your drone, which A, is a lot of money up front to take the test. <laughs> and if you fail the test, you don't get that money back. Um, so just know that if you're planning, you're thinking about getting a drone and you have a YouTube channel and it's monetized, you have to be legally licensed by the FAA because it's considered commercial work, because you're making money from that footage that you captured with your drone. Um, <laughs> that nonsense out of the way. Um, I definitely don't think it's a necessary piece of kit. It's fun to fly when I get the opportunity to fly. Um, the other thing I'll say is you should really use an app called like AirMap 
to make sure that you are flying where you are allowed to fly because there's a lot of protected air zones that we're not allowed to use our drone. So including wilderness areas. And I learned that one a couple years ago and I don't, I had no idea, but you can't fly in wildernesses. Um, the wilderness, protected wilderness is different than national forest or BLM. Um, but yes, you cannot, cannot fly in wilderness areas. So just keep, you know, there's a lot of things to learn. I'm blabbering. Drones are fun. Know the rules. Do it legally. Be respectful. That's, well, we'll stop. <laughs> Hello. Watching him from Snowmass Village. Woo. Oh, we'll see you in August. Oh, that's exciting. I have two questions to ask. Okay. Hello, Paul. Was, were you scared when you first moto camped and when you had uh, your accident and you broke your wrist, what, were you scared to ride afterwards? Um, the first time that I went motorcycle camping, oh my gosh, what was that? 2012? 2012. It was, it was pretty much like six months or so after I got my endorsement through MSF, Motorcycle Safety Foundation. So uh, about six months after I got my motorcycle endorsement, got a stamp on my license and everything, that was uh, simultaneously the first time I went motorcycle camping and also my first thousand miles uh, solo trip on a motorcycle. And of course it was on Lazarus. Um, I think I was more worried about uh, the bike breaking down than I was scared about anything happening to me while I was motorcycle camping. Um, I will say I camped at an RV park and everybody was super nice. Um, I pulled up and this little old lady that runs the RV park, at, I think it's Pierce's Green Valley RV park outside of like Touche, Washington. Um, they're so, so nice. If you ride through like Lolo Pass or like Highway 12 in general and you end up in that area, highly, highly recommend stopping at that RV park. They're, they're very kind. Um, the road going down into it is kind of steep and a little bit of gravel. So if you're on a big heavy cruiser and you haven't ridden gravel at all, maybe pass. But, um, it was easy enough for me to do as a new rider, six months of riding on a big 600 pound vintage bike. So I think that, I think that says something. <laughs> um, but there was, she was so nice. She opened the gate for me and like, let me in. Cause I was late. And she, like, she said, she was like, are you by yourself? And I was like, yes, all by myself. And she's like, you shouldn't be traveling alone on the bike through this area. You know, like there's such a big gap between towns and services. And don't you let me catch you coming back here without somebody else riding with you. And, and after that, she was just really sweet. And she offered me pie and she showed me, showed me where I was setting up my tent and everything, and that was when I was still had, like, that terrible Walmart tent. Ugh. Uh, no shame to anybody who loves their Walmart tent, but I hated that tent. <laughs> um, and I set up my camp and everything, and my neighbors came over and, like, made sure that I didn't need anything, and uh, it was awesome. I, I don't, like, that first night motor camping, I was not scared, no. Um, and I think that like has a lot to do with like doing it for the first time at a designated like RV park or a designated campground um, where you're surrounded by other people. And at that point I was um, more comfortable because everybody was very friendly and like I, all the good vibes, you know, um, it wasn't like I pulled up to like a forest service campground that was packed and like everybody was like, why are you here? It wasn't like that. Um, and the people who came next to me also offered me food. But at that point I was like, I, I was overly independent and I was like, no, I'm going to eat my own food. <laughs> but everybody was really nice. So the short answer is no, I wasn't scared when I moto camped for the first time. Um, and I kind of uh, suggest other people do that. If you, if you do have like any kind of fear around like motorcycle camping for the first time, like do it at like an RV park or a designated campground um, that has a host or something like that um, because it definitely like it le gives you a lean back so if you have questions or you need help or something like that people are gonna be around to help you um, and don't be afraid to go over and ask for help most people are very kind and more than willing to help you out um, uh, yeah yeah and what was the other part of the question was I scared uh, oh my gosh the chat has moved so much <laughs> Uh, when I, was I scared to ride after I broke my wrist? Um, 
I no, I didn't. I didn't experience uh, as much of the fear of getting back on the bike as uh, as a lot of other people have told me. Like they experienced after like an accident on the motorcycle, and I think that's because I didn't come off of the bike. Like <laughs> I didn't come off the bike. I didn't like other than my wrist. Nothing else on my body like was damaged. Um, I think. I when I low sided my Honda Shadow in the rain one time, I think that was way more traumatic than when I broke my wrist, um, because like the bike actually went down, I hit the ground, um, I had to get the bike back up, and of course I wouldn't start um, because the kill switch got hit accidentally, and I was there was too much adrenaline happening for me to notice that that happened. Um, so that experience was way more traumatic, even though like I nothing happened to me like i was perfectly safe like i didn't hurt anything on my body the bike was fine um but i think that was more traumatic and like took me a couple days to be like just get back on the horse amanda than it did for like when after my wrist was healed i just got back on the bike and i knew that i needed to stretch it out and like do it in uh, small batches until i could build myself back up to where i was um because my endurance was like so much lower after being off the bike for three months um yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, Jess, hi! Have you heard about the Honda Transalp 800cc coming back instead of the Mini Africa Twin? I have heard rumors that Honda copyrighted the Transalp name. I haven't uh, heard any confirmation that Honda was actually making the Transalp again, but that's super exciting. Um, I that Yes, I would be 100% behind that. That would be rad. Texas is warm. Uh, Roman, thank you. Roman around, thank you so much for the super chat. Thank you. Cheers, you guys. Thank you. I had cheese curds today. God bless Wisconsin. Cheese curds are amazing. Oh my goodness. Uh, Tillamook Creamery um, in Oregon does cheese curds, and you can only get them at the creamery, and they're like my favorite thing. <laughs> Hi. Space Cowboy, what tires do you prefer? I think on 17 inch like me. Uh, uh, yes, I my CD is 17 inch front wheel. I wish that I had a 19. It would be amazing if I had a 19, but yes, I have a 17. Right now, my I have a love affair going on with the Continental TKC70s because the amount of slab I do versus the amount of dirt that I'm on, they are perfect and long lasting. Um, I haven't kept exact track, but I know that I average about 10,000 miles on a pair of TKC 70s. Um, and then that's when I switch. So normally about like once a year I switch tires. Um, of course, like last year was like funky, but it still worked out to like once a year because I did all of my riding at the end of the year instead of the beginning of the year. Um, but yeah, TKC 70s, they're, they're my love, they're my favorites. I did have the Shinko 805s on the Tiger, um, but that's not going to fit on the 17-inch uh, wheel. I think, like, one of the Shinko 805s fits on the Honda and one doesn't. I can't remember if it's the front or the rear. Um, but when I, because I was looking into that, I was like, oh, well, if I do a BDR or something, I want to get the Shinkos because they're nice and cheap. They don't last as long as the Continentals, obviously, but you're paying way less for them. Um, I think that on the on the front Shinko 805 on the Tiger, I was getting like 8,000, 7,000 miles on it, um, 8,000. And then the rear, it was like more than like five or 6,000 um, before like the knob had rounded off enough and enough of the rubber had worn away that there wasn't really a point in having them anymore um, because they weren't creating traction anymore. Um, Long-winded answer for a simple question. That's me. Hi, Chris. My question for you is how do you video by yourself and get anywhere? It took me almost all day to do a video without a buddy and I didn't get more than 50 miles from home. Um, <laughs> that's a hard question. I think uh, having your system so that it's easy to pull out and fast um, helps a lot. Um, using other things than a tripod, if you're just gonna stop on the side of the road and talk to the camera really quick. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, if I'm gonna do, like, a super topic-heavy video, I don't get very far, very far. I normally, like, I ride out to a pretty location that I know that I can film without being interrupted a ton, or as much, <laughs> I should say. Um, 
And then I probably only moved like 10-ish miles in that area while I'm stopping and filming. Um, I try to change the location that I'm filming in uh, so that, you know, you get a different background and it's not just me standing in place talking to you, although sometimes I can't help it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the trick is just making sure that your setup is easy to pull out um, and you're not having to break everything down to put it away and then like put it all back together when you stop again um, using like fence posts and rocks and that kind of stuff as your tripod so you don't always have to pull out the tripod uh, to set up your camera to film yourself. Um, uh, having one of those like little tiny tripods that can fit in your tank bag um, also helps because um, like I love I love my Manfrotto tripod and like that is like my go-to uh, most of the time to get footage of myself especially if I'm standing upright <laughs> um, but like having a little tripod just to get like a little shot of you like walking by or even having a little tripod to set on top of another rock so you can get it all level and the way that you want the frame to look um, without having to pull out the tripod uh, is vital. Just trying to use your surroundings to your benefit, really. Um, and other than that, I think it's just practice. <laughs> um, I think the furthest distance that I've gone, like while trying to make like a topical video, not just a vlog, um, was when I did the like uh, tips for long distance riding. And that one, I went from Portland all the way down to the Stonehenge um, Memorial. I don't even know how far that is. What is that? Like 175 miles from Portland to there? And then I rode all the way back. But I wasn't filming on the way back. Um, yeah. Long. Yep. I think that answered your question. Sorry. Uh, do you have a time turner? <laughs> no, I don't have a time turner. <laughs> Pick up shots and B-roll takes so much time. For sure. Yeah. Um... And I don't know if you noticed, but I don't do a whole lot of shots where, like, I leave the camera behind and get a, a shot of the bike moving because that also, like, essentially doubles the time that you're already having to spend. And, like, a good rule of thumb is that, like, you kind of assume if Google Maps says it's going to take however long to get to a place, you double it when you're filming. <laughs> like, if it says, like, it's going to take me three hours to get to the Dalles, I know that it's going to at least take me five or four if I have to stop and film. Um, yeah, you don't need every every freckle to get out and do the thing. Yes, exactly. Thinking of starting YouTube for type 1 diabetics, I own a 900 Rally 2020 Triumph. Any advice? You seem down to earth and very trustworthy, so I thought I would ask you to keep everything. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, let's see. I did make a, uh, a video recently of like all of my secrets, um, about video and like how I make videos, how I go about making videos, how I manage SD cards, that kind of stuff. I think that would be super useful if you haven't watched that already. Um, I would, um, uh, like practice, like make, <sighs> start making videos. Like it doesn't have to be perfect like emphasis on the f like getting something out for people to watch is more important than it being perfect. Um, make sure that you can be clearly heard. That is very important. Um, if you, if I can't hear you because it's too quiet or because there's wind noise or because there's a lot of background noise and I literally can't understand what you're saying, then that's not worth posting. <laughs> um, because like people will click on realize they can't hear you and they will click off pretty much immediately. Um, so that's in, in those kind of cases and you get it, all that footage back. It is really frustrating to have to reshoot that kind of stuff. But um, if you want people to get something out of it and it's important to you that people see it, uh, uh, then it is 100% worth it to reshoot that um, if your audio cannot be understood. Um, so maybe like take a couple weeks to like make, you know, two or three videos for practice, um, going through the whole process of doing like, you know, like uh, uh, making a kind of checklist of things that you want to talk about and make sure that you cover in a video. Um, and then going through the filming process and then bringing it home and editing it because like editing is something that you only get better at with practice. Um, you can watch a ton of ed like editing tutorials and that does help a lot, but it's definitely something that you have to practice to get better at it. Um, but other than that, I would go and watch the, the video that I have about how I make videos because um, that's going to go into so much more 
in depth. Somebody said, like, this is Amanda's masterclass, and it's so true. <laughs> so go watch that. That's going to be super helpful. Can you recommend any resources to find women-only events? No offense meant to dudes. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, if you haven't heard of Babes Right Out already, like, that's a huge women's-only event. And, um, oh, gosh. Uh, I'm trying to think about how I found um, Dream Roll and those kind of things when I first started because they, like, they weren't huge um, when they first started. Um, I think just, like, uh, following a lot of other women who ride on like Instagram. If you're on Instagram, that's like that's how I find out about most women only events is through Instagram and following a lot of other women who ride on Instagram. Um, because like chances are like like they have a friend or somebody or they know somebody who started the event and they'll post about it and like that's how I find out about a bunch of stuff like the um uh like the women's only dirt event that's in the northeast. I can't think of what it's called right now. Um but yeah, that's 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 what I'd like follow a lot of other women writers on Instagram. Um I yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have a better resource for that. Um the Lita's uh like if you go to the Lita's website, sometimes they have a list of women's only events um on their in their blog. So that might also be a place to start if you go to the Lita's or like look up your local Lita's chapter um, and ask them if they know any local women's only events. Like that's, yes. What music do you have playing when you are writing? Ian, um, I normally, I think I listen to audiobooks way more than I listen to music when I'm on the bike. Um, but <laughs> don't disown me when I tell you that I listen to a lot of country like a lot of country and a lot of like 90s country and a lot of um, classic country. Um, George Strait and Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash and um, Waylon Jennings, uh, Don Williams. Um, but I also love Miranda Lambert. Um, I know that not everybody loves country and that's fine, but that's what I like. So. Um, hello from Alabama. Hi, Scott. Please keep us updated on the Africa Twin. Thinking about updating from a KLR. I might make a video about when I finally get to ride the Africa Twin, but like I said, no promises that I'm ever going to actually buy one. Hi! After my wife and I got blown off the highway, I think it was a good three years before I felt comfortable riding with any strong ones. Yeah, that's that would be pretty scary. I hit a deer at desk. Okay. <laughs> oh god, yeah. I just had to get my mind in place and learn to relax. Yes, 100%. Um, like, of so much of it is mind over matter. Like, understanding that a lot of our fear um, about getting back on back on the horse after an accident. Like, I literally broke my tailbone falling off of a horse. Um, and it's just something that you, you have to get back on. Um, otherwise, like, that fear just kind of overtakes you. And that's not, it's not something I was raised to deal with. If you get back on uh, as soon as you're able. What's the most miles you have put on a bike before you get rid of it? I don't, I can't answer that because I own all of my bikes. Well, okay, I got rid of the Tiger. Um, I think it had 3,000 miles on it when I got it. And I think it had like 15,000 on it when I left it. So I think I put 10,000 miles on the Tiger before I sold it. Um, but that is like hard to be an example because I sold it because I couldn't financially make the payments for it anymore. It just did not make sense for me to have this bike that I was making payments on every month and like essentially squeezing everything else super tight to make continue making payments on this bike when I have a bunch of other bikes that I own outright, no payments on. Um, and I was already doing everything that I was doing on the Tiger on the CB500X before I got the Tiger. So I think that's a special use case. Um, but other than that, I've never gotten rid of a bike, so. <laughs> Understand about Robin's deer anxiety. I live in a county and we are surrounded by them. Yeah, my brother hit a deer. It was very scary. It was very scary for me. Danelle, it's so nice to see you. Nice amount of miles on those tires. Glad to be able to catch one of you. Well, oh my gosh, thank you for being here. Oh, it's so awesome. Oh gosh. <laughs> Hi from the UK. I'd just like to say that you and... 
your channel are a real inspiration to get out there and do the thing. Oh, thank you, Ed. That's lovely. I appreciate that so much. <laughs> Anyone ride Beartooth Pass? Is it worth doing? Oh my god, Petty Nerd. You, oh, Beartooth is amazing. Oh, please do it. Please, please, please do it. Please, please. <laughs> I did it from, um, from, oh wow, the town name just left me. Um, Red Lodge? Red Lodge. There we go. I did it from Red Lodge up to, um, Yellowstone. And I think that is the best way, but I guess it depends on whether or not you feel more comfortable do climbing heights or coming down them. I like going up more than I like going down, but that's up to you. I thought it was awesome. I guess if you come down um, Beartooth into Red Lodge, then you get to experience more of like that view, view of the gorge. But the highlight for Beartooth for me is when you get to the top and you can see all the like little lakes and that kind of stuff, depending on what part of the season you are there. But it's gorgeous. Please do it. <laughs> Hello, Willow. Hello. Oh, Anna's biker is here. Hello. Oh gosh. What's up? <laughs> Hi. Yay! Okay. I'm glad other people actually watched that video of me talking about how I make videos. Like it <laughs> I was like, does anybody need this information? I don't know. What do you like to listen listen to in audiobooks? Any particular genre? Um, I really like fantasy and I love um, motorcycle travel journals. I don't know what kind of genre that would actually be. Um, but I love motorcycle travel journals. I love, uh, uh, fiction, um, and fantasy. Um, The Magicians was really good. Um, kind of slow at some points, but that's okay. I think I listened to the whole series of, uh, The Cave Bear or something like that. And I think that's, like, some kind of, like, historical fiction and romance. Um, I listen to romance novels when I'm at camp. <laughs> Probably too much information, but that's that's the truth of it. Um, uh, particular gems. Oh, now I have to open Audible so that I can look. Uh, if you do like romance novels, I have really been enjoying the like the um, what is it, the Outlander series. Um, by Diana uh, Gabaldon. Um, Alistair Humphreys has a awesome book about how he went around the world on a bicycle. That was a wonderful, wonderful book. I really enjoyed that. Um, Graham Field has a lot of really awesome audiobooks um, about uh, traveling on a motorcycle, like on a budget, so he doesn't have all the fanciest stuff. Graham Field is awesome. Um, he's on my, uh, when you go to my website and go to my blog, if you search like motorcycle books, Granfield is on my list of favorite motorcycle books. Yes. Um, let's see here. We'll go to my finished stuff that I finished. I'm an audible junkie, you guys. I also, I listened to The Handmaid's Tale on a trip. It's kind of funny, like, um, I can vividly remember, like, thinking about the book that I was listening to, I can vividly remember, like, everything that I saw on that trip because it's, like, so tied in my head to the book that I was listening to. Like, that's kind of funny. Um, when I was listening to The Hands Made Tale and The Testaments, I was on the, um, the Sony Camera Camp trip, so I was going from Portland to, um, like, essentially Great Falls-ish area in Montana, uh, and that's when the canister exploded my saddlebags. Um, but, like, even just thinking about the book, like, it brings back the, the memories of the trip that I was on when I was listening to that book, which I think is super cool. Um, and I don't have that with music. Anyway, yeah, I have a blog post about my favorite motorcycle books, so that is definitely something that you should check out if you're into audiobooks. Pretty much almost all of the books on that list are available on Audible. Do you ever come to Canada? Will I ever come to Canada, or do I ever come to Canada? I have not been to Canada yet. Um, if that's the question, uh, I, I want to, that's what I will say. I don't have plans. I haven't been there, but I want to go there. That's what I will say. Um, let's see. I'm trying to catch up with all of you guys. Oh my gosh. 
How could you forget Red Launch? <laughs> Mom is offended because I uh, I spent a whole summer in Red Lodge for um uh how do I describe it? It was Symphony Camp. <laughs> I used to I play violin for anybody who doesn't know. Um, I can play violin, and uh, when I was in middle school, I think it was middle school. I um. I joined the U Symphony in the Bitter Valley, and uh, I got to go to uh, Symphony U Symphony Camp in Red Lodge, Montana. Um, and I went through it and realized that uh, I have no nowhere near what it takes to be a professional um, musician, a part of a symphony. <laughs> I just can't hit the sixteenth notes uh, fast enough. I can't sight read as well as a lot of the other kids that were at that camp were like, wow, that was crazy. How has it already been an hour? You guys, what is time? And there's like a hundred people here. Wow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> anyway, that was your fun fact for the day. Amanda can play violin. She was a part of the symphony and then she gave up in high school. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's new drink time. Hello. You were the first motorbike channel that I watched when I got my motorbike and I wanted to say it. I was, oh, thank you so much, Paul. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Greetings from New Zealand on a Monday morning. One day I'll make some visits of the great riding in New Zealand. Gonna have to wait for the broken leg to heal. Oh, I hope that your leg heals soon, Kiwi. Oh my goodness. If you had to recommend on a place to see, what would that be? Oh, just like, just a place? Like, what? That's a lot of pressure. That is a lot of pressure. And then it's so dependent on like what you like already. Um, because what I like may not be what you like, you know? That's, that's a very, I don't know if I can answer that question. <laughs> Um, some of the things that were mind blowing for me to experience for the first time was like, like Beartooth Path was incredible. Going to the Sun Road and Glacier National Park was amazing. Um, uh, Utah, just in general, Utah was incredible. Um, cause it's just like going to a different planet and the, um, the landscape is so diverse. <laughs> Western Virginia was beautiful in a totally different way than the Western United States is. Hmm. Yeah, I think it depends on what you want, um, what you like, and what speaks to you. I mean, Orlando, thank you so much for the super chat. Cheers, man. Do you ever listen to podcasts during long rides? Uh, I have not, honestly hopped on the podcast train if i'm honest um i there are a couple of podcasts that i'd be listening to like normal to nomad from also ray's channel i love that that one um but that's just because like i'm a super fan of their channel already um uh two love rider podcast is is good to listen to every once in a while um but most of the time when i do listen to podcasts it's at home and i'm cleaning or something um on the road, for some reason, I just I just prefer listening to books. I guess I'm weird. I don't know. <laughs> Have you ever considered an iron butt and or miss the cruiser? I do still own the cru cruiser, Nova. Um, it's just living in Montana right now. Um, the Honda Shadow was a wonderful bike um, for what it was when I owned it. Well, not when I owned it. When it was here with me in Portland, I still own it. Um, I left it in Montana so my dad would have something safer to ride than um, this bike that he bought off of Craigslist. Shade, dad. Shade. <laughs> um, and I have thought about it recently, bringing it back over here um, just to have like just a straight up uh, highway bike to ride. But also like there's a lot of times when I just like when I'm just going to go for a ride and I'll look at a dirt road and I'm like, I'm just going to go down that. It's not a plan thing. I just do it. Um, and the Honda Shadow will definitely do it. Um, uh, but it's not as comfortable as the CB 500X, uh, off-road. 
<laughs> Definitely will do it. Any bikes and adventure bike can be try hard enough. I did like uh, all like that gnarly, uh, not gnarly, it's not gnarly, but that gr uh, gravel road all the way down to the Alvord Desert in uh, southeast Oregon on the Haunted Shadow and the weird sandy road onto the Alvord Plier Playa on Haunted Shadow. It will do it. It's just not as comfortable. Um, I guess I could uh, upgrade the rear shocks and it would definitely be a lot more comfortable, but yeah. I don't regret leaving the Hot of Shadow in Montana because like the, the the times that my dad has been able to ride with it, um, to be able to ride with me because I had a bike in Montana for him to ride while I was on the whatever bike I brought to Montana has been totally worth it. So I don't regret that at all. Um, as, as far as the iron bike goes, I do really want to just like fulfill at least like the, the thousand mile in a day iron butt um, because I followed Carrie back from um, Babes Are Out what was that, six or something, seven? Um, the one in, in Central Oregon that I went to in like 2019? I think that was 2019. Um, and I followed her back when she was doing her iron butt. And I, I got like literally like 900 miles even when I hit Portland and she did the last um, stretch up to Seattle to finish her iron butt. And I was one of her witnesses and that kind of stuff. And I realized like, I could have done it. I definitely, I could have, I could have hit the 1000. I just didn't because I, didn't see any point and keep going any farther because I was already home. <laughs> um, it would be fun. I think it would be awesome. Um, I don't know if it's something that I would just like do by myself. I think uh, I want to convince Carrie to go and do it with me. So I can just like follow her. I definitely push myself more when I'm riding with other people than I do when I'm riding by myself. Because when I'm riding by myself, I have a very um, healthy, we don't have to do anything. We had nothing to prove to anybody. If I'm uncomfortable, if I'm tired, you know, even just a little bit, I just stop and I listen to my body and I stop and I stretch and I do those kinds of things um, because it's not worth it um, when I'm riding by myself to push any more than I have to. Um, Buffalo49, thank you so much for the super chat, man. Cheers. Cheers, man. What's your drink of choice tonight? Oh, um, right now we are... Bird dog in LaCroix. That's what this is. Um, yeah, most of the time it's just whiskey. That reminds me, somebody on Instagram asked me what my favorite trail beer was. And I'm very sorry to tell you, and I hope that you don't disown me, but I don't like beer. <laughs> I will drink hard cider. I will drink whiskey. I will drink whiskey all day. Um, but I don't like beer. I just don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> whiskey forever speaking of also I had to watch the camp video again today so no one will get that I'm sure <laughs> the camp video is so cute camp um, is Elsa Ray and Baron's dog and for those who don't follow Elsa Ray and Baron they live in a 13 foot scamp trailer they have lived in a 13 foot scamp trailer pulled by a Subaru for like 3 or 4 4 plus years now and her content is just super calming and I love it so much. So if you haven't checked it out already, I know that there's no motorcycles in it, but it's just calming. If you like camping stuff, just check out at least one video. I think you'll enjoy it. Love audiobooks as well. You are not weird, or maybe we are. <laughs> I was just pausing one when you came on. What motorbike boots do you use or recommend? I have the Garen Altering Gore-Tex boots and I have owned those since shortly after the pilgrimage. So I think that I've had them for um, five years now. Five years now. Um, I love them. My feet have never been wet. They're super old. I will not get rid of them until they fall to pieces. And even if they do fall to pieces, I will probably take them to a cobbler to get repaired before I buy another pair of boots. <laughs> Marco, any plans to come or go to Europe currently? Not currently. Um, I really, really want to go to Italy. I don't know if I would be able to ride in Italy, um, but that like that's top of my list. I am Sicilian, so that just seems appropriate. Um, but I don't have any plans right now to go to Europe. Um, it's a lot of lot of money. A lot of money. Don't have a lot of money, so I'd be pretty choosy about where I go. How much does a tank of gas cost you? Probably about 10 bucks most of the time. I do use premium. 
World Riot writer Alan Carl is here. Thank you so much for the super chat, man. Cheers. Wow, I feel very special for you being here. Thank you. I appreciate that. How much uh, whiskey, hot lemon, tea, and honey? Hot toddies! Yes! Uh, when I was living with my grandpa when I was in college, that was like always his response whenever I was sick was uh, making me a hot toddy. <laughs> All right, another question from Instagram. Without counting the edit process, how much time does it take um, to film something? Uh, I don't keep track when I'm filming on the road um, because I'm just like, it's like short clips uh, pretty much all day. Um, so I'll stop and get a pan of something and that takes about two or three minutes to stop and do. Or if I stop and talk to the camera for a little bit, it takes me like, I don't know, uh, 30 minutes or something like that to stop and just do a short update to the camera. Um, so it's just kind of like little snippets pretty much all day if I'm vlogging, if I'm going on a trip and I'm just vlogging. Um, but if I'm like filming a, like a topic video in the garage, just like talking head videos that I like to do in the winter time, those on average take me about four to five hours to film. Four, yeah. Um, four hours most of the time, five hours, six hours for super complicated stuff. Like, so like the, how I make videos video it took me like six hours to film. Um, but that's because like I had to sit, had to sit down and do the talking head stuff, um, and capture B-roll. Same thing with like the packing video that I did. That one definitely took six hours to film because I had to do the stop and do the talk. I had to do the talking head stuff, but then I also had to capture all the B-roll of every single item that I was talking about. Um, so yeah, like five like four to six to seven hours depending on the topic if I'm filming in the garage um but on the road I don't really keep track because it's just like capturing whatever I'm doing while I'm doing it so I don't really count if that makes sense how long does it take you to prepare to do a live stream an hour <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous um but yeah, I, I, uh, my significant other and I share an office. So an hour before the stream is supposed to start, that's when I'm like, okay, I need, I need the office. And so I essentially kick him out. I love you. <laughs> um, uh, and that's when I start the setup process for the live stream. So I set up the tent and the, like my tables and stuff, and then the camera and the mic. And then I make sure that everything is working with OBS and YouTube. So yeah, an hour. And even today with the whole hour, it's, I was still restarting my computer to make sure that all the tech stuff was working 20 minutes before the live stream start, <laughs> started. Any idea if you will get twisted and ride the sisters in Texas? I don't know. It's not on my radar right now, Ed. <laughs> Two wheels down, gonna get the bike out of storage tomorrow. That's so exciting! That's awesome! It bare to three times back in 2015. It was awesome. Been on to Idaho. The bare to is just so gorgeous. I guess if you really wanted to get the most out of it, you would have to do it at least two times to go down and go up. That way you get like both of the both views. Um, bringing my Indian Challenger to Rocky Mountain Rural from Oklahoma or Oklahoma City. I noticed two addresses on my confirmation email. Which one should I use? Um, Michael, email me. <laughs> um, uh, the short answer is like when you, in the email, not the address that Eventbrite gave you, but the email that I gave you in the note. So you read all of like the little rules that I gave you and like the hints about like where the address is. And then I list the address at the, at the bottom of the email. That is the address of the ranch. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Urban uh, Hepler asked, where are you going to ride the, when are you going to ride the tail of the dragon? I don't know. Maybe the first, maybe the next time I go to the East Coast. I mean, like, that would be cool, but I don't have any super plans right now. Woman Awakening, thank you so much for the super chat. Cheers. Oh, thank you. When you're filming, do you ever say to yourself, I could sure use a happy meal? No, no, that's not something that I tell myself. <laughs> I don't, I don't actually like 
um, fast food, you guys. It's not it's not something that I like. Um, and even like even then, like my idea of like getting fast food on the road is Subway, and I know that's not like the awesomest fast food, but it still makes my body feel better than trying to eat at McDonald's or any other fast food joint. I wish my wife and I could do your event, but the border is still closed. I am so sorry. Ugh, man, I hope the border op reopens again. We have so many awesome people from Canada that normally come down to Rocky Mountain Roll that just can't right now, and it's a super bummer. Um, James asks, how do you feel about your motorcycle? Um, how, how did I feel about how my motorcycle did running a continuous 80 miles an hour on I-90? I think the CB did fine. I don't have any complaints about how she did. She did awesome. Um, I mean, obviously, like, it's a 500cc motorcycle. It's not like you're uh, trying, you're not running on the highway on, like, a 1200cc bike. It's not, it's going to feel different. Um, but I think the bike did fine. I don't, I didn't have any issues with it, like, running hot at high speed for that long. It did fine. Um, you definitely feel it in your body a lot more than you would on a big cruiser, that's for sure. Not to be a downer, but have you experienced any difficulty keeping your personal and public life separate, or does being on YouTube just mean you have to be public? I saw Doodle's video on this, and I was curious. Um, I don't think I have a huge problem keeping my personal and public life separate. Um, I think that I do a pretty good job about it. But I also think that I am more comfortable sharing a lot more of my personal life than some other YouTubers do. Um, especially when I'm on the road, I share like a lot and I, um, especially about how I'm feeling and, um, that kind of stuff. And I kind of noticed that some other YouTubers just don't, uh, talk about that. Um, uh, yeah, or at least I, I feel like I do a pretty good job. I don't, I don't feel personally like it's a big deal or that there are a lot of people who are trying to wiggle their way into my personal life versus my youtube life <laughs> um especially because like since youtube started as just a way for me to journal my experience traveling on the road um that precedent has like pretty much consistently stuck through like my like life on the road is a, is the life that you see on youtube if that makes sense i think that makes i hope that makes sense when you had a broken wrist i know it's a, was your drawing hand but could you draw at all um, I did eventually teach myself how to draw with my left hand while my uh, right hand was in uh, the cast because I just couldn't stand it anymore. Um, if you watch to the very, very end of that video about how I broke my wrist, you will see like me like flop on the couch and just be really upset. And that's because I couldn't draw because like drawing for me is a first and writing a second. I know that's probably sounds pretty blasphemous, but... Um, yeah, uh, drawing to me is my first love. Motorcycles are my second. Um, so not being able to draw for like three months was just devastating. Um, so like, I, I can't remember. I want to say it's, it was at least like a month into it. Like after I finished mourning and that sounds dramatic, but it's true. I was just like mourning everything that I couldn't do now that my wrist was broken, mourning all the opportunities that I missed because my wrist was broken. Um, and then just started teaching myself to draw with my left hand. And it was so hard and it was very exhausting in a weird way. I could only draw for like maybe an hour before I was just like too tired to keep doing anything. And that may also just be because like my body was taking so much energy to try to heal the fracture in my wrist as well. And that's something to keep in mind if you have an injury and you get tired doing small things, like keep in mind that your body is working really hard to heal another part of your body. <laughs> um, but yeah, I did end up like learning to draw with my left hand a little bit. Um, I did do an article for Pentalic, um, which is a art supply company about um, my process of like mourning the ability to draw with my right hand while I was injured and the process of learning to draw with my left hand. <laughs> I sold you on getting a CD500X, Scott, that's awesome. Do it! Do you have a favorite food when you are moto camping? Um, hmm. I think I go through phases. Uh, for a while it was like pasta and some, and some kind of vegetable. Um, and for a little while it was rice and like kind of like a rough stir fry and some tuna on top. I definitely have dumped the tuna recently, but I think my favorite is still 
making some rice in my pot and setting it aside um, and making like kind of like some stir frying some vegetables and putting some cashews in it. That's still my favorite right now. I'll probably change something else, but that's still my favorite. Rice and some stir fried vegetables and some cashews. Definitely appreciate your honesty. Your vids are so authentic and it's much appreciated. Thank you, Nova. I really appreciate that. Um, I think that's like part of the of the different thing about my videos is that like they just they just are a little bit more quote unquote personal about how I'm feeling and how things are going when I'm on the road and I don't like I'm not trying to just make a pretty like uh, tourism video or anything like that this, this is just like legit my travel diary <laughs> I want to motorbike safe I went to motorbike safety event in New Zealand and while there bumped into Brett Tkex all talk about surprise and in awe imagine if you just turned up that would <laughs> that would be crazy um, <laughs> I did actually get to talk to Brett um, when I was working at the dealership we, we had talked about like doing a um, I think we ended, actually ended up doing it I just wasn't able to go um, uh, doing like a 101 uh, ADV writing course for uh, Carl's Mystery Rides with Brett um, so I have gotten to talk to him in person but like not on like a 101 level just like on a business level um, so that's awesome you got to meet him that's cool where there's a will, there's a way. For a hundred percent. Greetings from Arizona. Hi, Robert. Various bikes and camping starting to rain. Time to go test the new riding pants. Hit me up later and we'll set up something. Awesome. Yeah. I hope your riding pants stay waterproof. Um, I hope so. Keeping my fingers crossed for you. Greetings from Rainy UK. Hi, Bernie. Thanks for being here. Hi, you guys. Okay, another question from Instagram. Have you considered van life for some tours instead of riding? Not really because like buying a van would be a whole other thing and that's just not in the cards for me. Especially with the thought of like buying another vehicle just to travel when I could use the money that I would have to pay to buy that vehicle to just go, the, go to the place on the bike. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I could freaking like go to South America and back on the same amount of money it would cost to buy a van and kit it out and everything. Um, I have thought about like getting a trailer for the truck because I have a truck camper now. Um, not, I guess not everybody knows that, but I have a truck camper um, and I love it so much. It was, I mostly have it so that like my significant other and I can go camping together since he doesn't ride. Um, but I have thought about like getting a trailer to like tow behind um, with the truck camper on the back of my truck, the bike and the trailer and like just to be able to go to places like Utah and Arizona in the wintertime in Oregon when it's not super feasible to ride my bike down there because all of the high passes are snowed out and iced up. Um, so that would be super cool, but definitely not van life. Not not for me. <laughs> to the, the financial cost um to be able to create the adventure mobile to do those things it just doesn't make sense to me right now um being left-handed i was forced to be amb ambidextrous ambidextrous but it was a good thing keep writing and drawing with your left hand if you don't have to even if you don't have to thank you ed <laughs> honestly i pro i haven't drawn with my left hand since the cast came off so Embrace the suck. I love the sediment. Travel isn't always rainbows and butterflies. For sure, Robin. Oh my goodness. Yeah, no. <laughs> Are you a Portland Trailblazer fan? Love your videos. Thank you, Toto. Um, I... Another one of those, like, please don't disown me. But I don't follow sports. <laughs> I, I just don't. It's never been a thing. Uh, I did play baseball and soccer, and I love playing sports, but I don't follow sports, if that makes sense. <laughs> Hello from Saskatoon in Canada. Snow here is melting quick. Can't wait to get my intruder out on the road. I hope this. I hope you can get out and have fun soon. Yay! Another question from Instagram. Um, what is your non ADV dream bike? I don't think I've ever thought about this actually. 
Um, I do love the Thruxton. The Triumph Thruxton is just a beautiful bike. Um, I think it would be fun to have a street glide. Um, but again, like the conversation we had on the last live stream, I just I want I want the street glide looks, but I want the road glide fixed. Like I want the fairing off of the street glide, but I want it to be fixed, like to the frame and not the forks. Um, but I did really like the street glide when I worked at the dealership, and I did like the Road King a lot when I worked at the dealership. But I think that's more just because the Road King reminded me a lot of my Honda Shadow. <laughs> Um, wow, I, I really haven't thought about this. Um, like, <laughs> I've been, my, my brain for, like, dream bikes has been so fixed on the Africa Twin for so long, I don't really have, like, other dream bikes, to be honest. <laughs> um, and when I, yeah, the only time that I ever thought about, like, some, uh, something other than an, an AV bike is when I worked at the dealership, because, like, having a bike that was the brand of the dealership that I was working at just made more sense to be able to make more content for their social media because I was the events and social media marketing manager there. Um, but that was really mostly it. Um, and it's like having like a, either a sport touring or a cruiser like bagger um, made more sense for like long, like super long distance journeys um, because they're so much more comfortable. But after doing the big trip on the CB500X, I, I don't have any complaints about it. Like, yeah, it's um, less like staying on a lazy boy, but it did fine. Like, I don't have any huge complaints about it. There wasn't anything glaring that I was like, oh, I need a bigger bike for this. It was, you know, it did the job. I didn't have any serious body issues afterwards, you know. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Most of my best travel stories come from when something went disastrously wrong. Yes. A hundred percent. Hello from Barcelona. Hi, Joan. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Kane. Hello. Oh, thank you, Toto. I thank you for not disowning me because I don't like sports. <laughs> Okay, um, a couple more questions and we'll wrap it up now that we've hit the one hour mark. Uh, how do you keep your hands from going numb while riding? I don't, I think the only time that I've had my hands go numb while I was riding was because of the cold. Um, I don't, like if, or, be, or if my gloves were too tight, my hands would go numb. So I guess I would start there. If your hands are going numb while you're riding, Make sure that your gloves fit the way that they're supposed to. Make sure that the ergonomics of your bike work for you and that you're not cutting off circulation to your hands somehow. Um, I had an issue with that when I was riding the Thruxton for a little while, um, when, it, while I was working at the dealership, is because like since your your wrists are like cocked so much, like you're cutting off circulation at a certain extent. Um, Bob asked, are you still at the dealership? I'm not still at the dealership. I was let go. Um, in 2000 and early, early 2019, I was let go, I think, pretty sure, yes, yes, early 2019, I was let go, they couldn't afford me anymore, I was too expensive, <laughs> um, anyway, talking about go hands going numb, topic, Amanda, wow, um, short attention span. Um, yeah, make sure that the ergonomics of the bike that you're riding, uh, adjust them so that you're not cutting off circulation to your hands somehow. Make sure that your gloves fit. And if they're, if you're losing circulation or if you can't feel your hands because they're going numb, then I recommend heat grips and hippo hands. Amazing combination. Um, I have tried like heated gloves specifically. They're just not my style. Um, Especially ones that aren't battery powered. I hate being plugged into the bike so much. I was wondering, out of all the trips you have done, what has been the most challenging thing you have had to overcome? Um, I I mean, like the pilgrimage was full of like all of like a, a, a lot of firsts for me, and probably like the most challenging thing. Um, was running out of oil on the top of Judith Peak in Lewiston, Montana, and having to walk for an hour to find somebody to help me. 
um, because I was out of options. I had to pick up the bike like, I don't know, four or five times that day. And um, when I got to the top of Judith Peak, I dropped it that one last time. And of course, like I have a leak in the valve cover of that bike. So all of the oil made its way out of my bike that day. And I didn't notice that that was the problem. I got to the top of Judith Peak, dropped it the one last time, and it wouldn't start anymore. I had no way to contact anybody. Um, I didn't have the in-reach at that point and having to walk a whole hour to get somebody. Like, I cried the whole time I was trying to find somebody to help me. Um, it was very emotional for me. Um, I think that was huge. And having to just get used to asking for help, that was also huge for me. Um, like, from strangers. Just, like, accepting that they might say no, but you have to ask anyway. Um, that, that was definitely, I think that, yeah, I think that I'm going to go with that. That was the most challenging thing that I've ever had to overcome is just, um, getting used to having to ask for help from strangers in the case that you need help. Like, it's just something that you have to do. <laughs> um, of course, like I have the in reach now, but even then I probably still would have like done what I did to try to find help rather than trying to text my family members to come and help me. Um, because I was in the middle of Montana, it would take them, took them a, a whole day to come and find me. Um, even if I could have texted them my exact location and all those things. So yeah. <laughs> Being a woman, have you ever found it difficult? Find, do you ever find, huh, sorry. Have you ever found a di difficult situation in your adventures? I think I just answered that pretty much. Um, but I don't think it is related to me being a woman. <laughs> it's just a, it's a thing that you have to experience when you travel alone on a motorcycle. <laughs> if I'm tense, my fingers go numb, but only because I have a death grip on the bar. <laughs> That's a good point, Scott. Make sure that you're not death gripping the bars. That's also a very important thing for your hands not to go numb on the handlebars. <laughs> Took Willow down and got her nails done and detailed. Oh, that's sweet. Oh, thank you, Kathy. That's very nice of you. Thank you so much, you guys. You're so nice to me. <laughs> okay, last call. <laughs> and then we're we'll we'll hang up the hang up the towel. Riding over the Tobin Bridge can be freaky. Ooh, where is the, where is that? Oh, isn't that, isn't it like they've got a giant suspension bridge in Wisconsin? Um, I've heard about that. I read, a, I read a, another book of somebody who is documenting their trip around the country, and she wrote over that. I can't remember for the life of me what that book was called, though. Um, I'm like three quarters of the way through it. I started it because somebody recommended it to me right before I did my big cross-country trip, and I was thinking about a bunch of the passages while I was traveling. What fears did you have in the beginning that you don't now, I'm assuming? Hi, Todd. It's lovely to see you. That I don't worry about now. My bike breaking down. That was my biggest fear when I started traveling by myself was my bike breaking down. Um, I guess part of that I don't have now because I don't ride Lazarus as much as I used to. Um... I even when I do still ride Lazarus, breaking down is still kind of a fear in the back of my head, but I have so much experience now fixing her on the side of the road or in hotel parking lots that that fear isn't really there anymore. And um, the CD500X is so reliable. I have had zero issues with Briarios, so that's really not a fear with him. Um, but even if he does have an issue... I feel so much more prepared now to deal with those issues. Um, I don't know. That might sound weird to some people, but yeah, that was, that was my biggest fear when I first started riding and doing long distance travel was the bike breaking down and dealing with that. And part of the, part of that fear was also just not financially being able to pay somebody else to fix it. So I have to fix it myself. Um, I can pay for the parts, but I would have to fix it myself. Um, and I, yeah, after, especially after the pilgrimage, all that experience of fixing the bike pretty much all summer um, pretty much eliminated that fear for me and uh, definitely gave me a lot more faith in myself that I would be able to get through whatever the road had to hand me and it would be fine. <laughs> oh, thank you.
you so much for the super chat. I don't know if I can say your username. SG tick. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for the super chat. Cheers, man. Would love a video where you discuss the ins and outs of working at a dealership, um, what you learned about sales and how to be a good buyer. Ooh, that's interesting. I never, hmm, <laughs> nobody's asked me for that before. Um, uh, I wasn't a salesperson, to be clear. So I didn't have, I didn't deal with a lot of, of the like ins and outs of, of sales and buying in a dealership. Um, all of my experience working at the dealership was as um, events coordinator. So I was responsible for creating a lot of the events, leading and uh, organizing group rides and uh, social media management. Um, so I didn't deal a lot, a lot with the sales. So I'm not sure I could uh, answer like the how to be a good buyer um, part of that equation. Um, but I mean, if you guys are interested in it, I'll, I would happy to be uh happy to make a video about working at a dealership um although i'm sure a bunch of my experience is kind of outdated now um since working like the whole ecosystem of dealerships is so specific to the dealership as well um and uh, uh the conversation interaction with like the brand um uh, that you're working with is also super dependent like working with harley davidson is so much different than working with triumph and I'm sure even more different than working with Harley and Cowie and um, the Japanese brands. Um, uh, from conversations with other people, like working with like Japanese brands, like Cowie and Honda and Suzuki and that kind of stuff, is way more relaxed than working with Harley Davidson and Triumph because Harley Davidson and Triumph both have like um, certain expectations of how you represent the brand. Um, they have their fingers way more into it than how like Honda and Cowie and Suzuki expect you to represent their brand. It's a totally different thing. Do you dabble in graphite as a medium? Um, not not any more than just drawing with a pencil, really. And even then, um, I really like the Prismacolor color erase pencils, and I think that's closer to drawing with like a color pencil than it is to drawing with like a graphite pencil. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. I appreciate that. All right, you guys. Oh, hi, Mary Jane. I'm so glad you were able to catch the live stream. I hope, I hope it wasn't boring as a new viewer. <laughs> yeah, most of my travels on a 34-year-old BMW sidecar. I'm prepared for anything. Yes. Yeah, I think if you if you ride a bike that's any anything more than like ten years old, you pretty much have to be ready for for anything. <laughs> oh, thank you guys. All right, you guys. I think we're gonna we're gonna close down the live stream now. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, as always, links to my Etsy and Rebel shop and Ko-Fi and Patreon will be linked down in the description. If you want to watch next week's video now. You can, for as little as $1 a month, you can get early access to those videos over on Patreon. They already have access to next week's video. They will have access to the video that's going to be posted next week. At, like, words are cool. Point is, the Patreon already has access to the video that's going to go up Friday. So if you want early access to videos, $1 a month over on Patreon, you get access to those things, as well as, like, my sketchbook stuff. Um, every... Once in a while, I make Patreon-only videos. Wow, this is really hard to do um, when I've already had two drinks. <laughs> anyway, play. thank you guys so much for being here. Oh my goodness, I should just stop now. <laughs> I love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. You are the reason that I keep making videos. So, thank you. <laughs> I will see you Friday in the comment section. Cool. Bye!